Jackal among snakes author, Nemorosus, chapter 101, Sentinel's Capstone. Alistair ducked beneath the iron gate of the menagerie where a few of the stone epital sentinels awaited him. Nothing, sir, the closest to Alistair said immediately. Nothing? Alistair repeated. He raised up both hands, kneading his gauntlets together anxiously. Gods be damned. Where would he have put the accursed thing? We searched everywhere. All the rooms, every corner. Not a thing, the sentinel confirmed, shaking his head. Damn it all, Alistair muttered, ducking back out of the menagerie and into the balcony of the second floor. He leaned against the railing, staring out at the soaked floor. Even despite the blood having washed through the place, traces of the battle where our grave had supposedly conjured enough magic to kill everything within sight lingered. According to Ossian, despite his display of power, our grave seemed able to use magic, a veritable bottomless well of power well befitting a prince of Vesca. Yet even still, something did not feel right. A deceiver remained a deceiver. Even their efforts to prove the contrary were merely grander shows of deceit. Alistair knew this well because he was a deceiver himself. Though he played the part of the Honorable Master Sentinel, well concerned for the welfare of those beneath him, he truly only cared for the position of Grand Master. He had wasted his youth in this doomed knightly order, at the very least, he would be its master before his death. Alistair watched the blood, his old and scarred face tense beneath his stifling plate helmet. After a time of staring, his face relaxed, eyes locked on the blood. He knelt down, retrieving a rock with a frown on his face. He dropped it, and it impacted with the flora story below. Ripples spread out, quick and shallow, but present, mixed with water. It's not just blood, Alistair said aloud in awe as he came to the answer. At once, he moved to the stairs, rushing down them as quick as his heavy armor would allow. He walked out to the door, out into the city of Nordmid, ignoring the confused cries of the sentinels behind him. Moving alone in the low way was ill-advised, but Alistair was too overcome with excitement to allow his caution to control him. He rushed to the side of the platform, leaning out and staring across the canals. As his eyes took in the sights, he started to realize something. The flow is different. The sluices have been moved. The realization brought a smile to his face, though it could not be seen beneath his helmet. The sentinels beneath him, concerned for his well-being, caught up to him. Alistair, sir, one called out, not overloud because of their location. One of you, return back to the lower levels. Gather everyone serving beneath me, he commanded, removing his sash of stone roses around his chest. Use this to ensure their obedience. The rest of you. We search the city, checking the sluice control points for the severed head. Alistair turned his head back to the canals, where the water rose especially high. Our grave is no prince. He used the floodgates to create an overflow. Hash. Someone approaches, Gleman informed our grave, stepping in front of him. They were in the final hallway out of the lower levels, and towards freedom, ostensibly, once they were on the road towards the crimson wellspring, their days of dealing with the sentinels would be over. A fight awaited them to claim the artifact, but despite his weakened state, Argrave felt extremely confident it would be easy. Someone? Argrave pressed. A lone armored footman, a sentinel, Glamon told Argrave. Argrave considered this. All right, let's keep going. Tell me of anything more. They proceeded forward, Argrave readjusting the backpack on his back. Their food rations were greatly reduced, and it felt much lighter than before. Still, he kept a slow pace, being careful not to overexert his lungs. Glamon looked back. He has a sash bearing stone roses. Argrave frowned. You mean? Another one? Besides the one on his chest? Aye, it has near twenty. Argrave didn't know what to make of that. Fortunately, Annalise supplied. These sashes are a sign of command, as you told me, she looked to Argrave. If so, it would be given to a subordinate to deliver an order with their authority. I see. Argrave looked at the ground, then at Annalise. So, Alistair has something important to get to the rest of the group. My cover story's been exposed, maybe. Both said nothing, but that was answer enough for Argrave. Even still, he spent a long while deliberating on the matter before giving his answer. This person might be delivering an order that could compromise a lot of their future progress. He might not be, though. Stand aside, let him pass. What? Asked Glimmon incredulously. Let him pass a bit, Argrave amended. Then, deal with him. In whatever way you deem. Most efficient, Argrave finished bitterly. Glimmon nodded slowly, then patted Argrave on the shoulder as though to reassure him the choice was correct. Argrave didn't feel any less terrible about it, though. Soon enough, the sentinel approached. Their party of three stood aside, Glamon even giving a polite nod to the sentinel as he jogged past. As much as Argrave didn't want to watch, he didn't dare look away considering the potential danger. Perhaps he should have, though. Glamon grabbed the sentinel's helmet with one hand and quickly dispatched him by jamming his enchanted knife into his neck. The sentinel struggled only once before dying. It was hauntingly similar to the way Glamon had killed the one outside the low way. Dot I believe we would be best off hiding the body, Annalise suggested. Argrave cannot move especially quickly anyway and it only benefits us. We can dump it into the canal. Argrave nodded, and then moved forward. Not wrong. I'll try and hurry. Alistair is probably looking for calm. He can take care of himself, but we'd still better be quick. Quick as I can manage, 
at least. He touched his chest, then rolled his shoulder, pulling the heavy grey dustier over his shoulders. Gorman hefted the body over his shoulder, then moved forward. Hash. Alistair entered into one of the sluice control rooms. He had been examining the way that the sluices were set up, and by his estimation, this one would be pivotal had our grave genuinely flooded the lower levels with the canals. The sluice control room was narrow and simple, made of stone and filled with an unpleasant mildew. It was dark, no light prevailing. In the center, three rusted chains descended down below. Alistair looked into the hole, and he could see rushing red water just beyond it. The sluices could be raised and lowered in this room. Alistair walked about, scanning the room as best he could in the lack of light. He felt along the wall trying to feel things out. The only source of light came from the doorway. The light of Nordmade was faint outside, but it was doubly so within buildings. Eventually, he came to a turn wheel quite similar to the one just before the menagerie. Alistair tugged at it, and despite the fact that it was quite old, it moved easily, evidence it had been used recently. He heard footsteps behind and lowered himself. Soon enough, both of his men entered into the room, and Alistair stood quietly. No luck? Alistair inquired. No, sir. Both replied asynchronously. We've searched all of the other nearby sluice gates, one followed up. Then search this one, Alistair pointed down. Carefully, considering everything, this place is the most vital. If anywhere, I suspect the head will be here. They entered deeper, combing along the walls and heading for the back. Once the two were deep enough in, a light flickered at the entrance. An arrow shot out, glowing in the light. Alistair, reflexes trained for decades against vampires and guardians, nimbly ducked behind the sluice controls and a burst of fire scorched where the arrow struck the stone. Find cover, Alistair directed calmly. They're here. They have enchanted arrows. Alistair breathed out silently as his sentinels moved to obey. The situation was desperate, he knew, but he had survived much worse. He drew his sword from his waist, holding it at attention. Argrave, Alistair called out. That abominable head of yours, I have it. It's in my hands, he bluffed. My head is still attached to me, last I checked. A familiar hoarse voice rang out at once. You want it back. You want to gain access to all the places within the low way. Take all its treasures for yourself, Alistair continued. I can take that away. Another arrow shot out, and Alistair shrunk away. A yelp of pain sounded out in the distance alongside the crackle of electricity, and Alistair clenched his teeth tight. That warrior the boy brought along isn't for show. Rolf. Alistair questioned. I'm fine, sir. My left arm is shot, though. Alistair grit his teeth taking better cover. Damn it all. Why are they out so quick? Thought it would take an hour, minimum, for them to find what they need. Nowhere to escape. Think. Damn it. Fire another shot. I kill the head. Alistair bluffed once more. Oh, yes, I'm sure you will, Argrave said, sarcastic voice betraying his utter lack of belief. Fine, I'll do as you did. Flood the lower levels. Everyone will come here. Your ooze will be broken. Alistair pivoted forward, grabbing the turn wheel for the sluice. Remaining in cover, he started to raise it once more. The chains groaned in protest. The sound disguised the sound as another arrow fired out, but Alistair managed to avoid being hit narrowly, a trail of magic whizzing by his hand. Just as he started to hear a torrent of water rushing by below as the sluice rose, Alistair felt hot pain on the back of his head. The blow did little damage on account of the helmet, but Alistair staggered forth. As if expecting this, the gargantuan elf rushed forth, already swinging his blade. The blow seemed to fall short, so Alistair stepped back. A blade of wind leapt out, and Alistair, panicked raised his own to block it. The blade of wind struck Alistair's sword, and the ferocity of the enchanted weapon's attack knocked the sword out of his hand. The elf still rushed forth, charge undeterred. Alistair fell to his back and thrust his feet out, trying to stop the charge as a pikeman might stop cavalry. Alistair barely saw the curved great sword flying towards his face before it pierced his neck, sliding beneath his helmet. The elf pulled out his blade mercilessly, stepping past Alistair. Alistair's head fell back as he clutched at his neck. In his last moments, he tried to search out what had struck him. Had one of his own betrayed him? The very idea filled him with an indignant wrath. Then he saw it. A brown-haired head, impaled on a stake. Its cold black and gold eyes stared down at Alistair as he writhed. He reached out for it in vain, and it watched passively. When Alistair's hand finally grew near, he felt the last bit of strength drain from his body. He watched as magic swirled about the head, a blade of wind appearing right above his eyes. Die, mutt. The blade descended and darkness took Alistair, Master Sentinel of the Stone Epital Sentinels. Chapter 102, Thicker Than Water Argrave stared into the rushing red water, watching it rise and writhe against the red-stained stone. He leaned against a railing just before the canal. Annalise stood just beside him, looking around Nordre made with Garm in her hand. Evidently she had grown to tolerate the place much better, for she was less troubled than Argrave. He was coming to terms with the fact that Berinda had changed him. Beyond the initial rush of fear, uncertainty, and panic that cropped up in the act itself, he wasn't bothered by what had happened today. Four people had died, their bodies cast into the canals. He had been the engine behind their deaths, even if he had not killed himself. Despite that, 
Their deaths did not weigh at his thoughts as the druids had. Perhaps it was because he had come to loathe the sentinels. Perhaps it was merely that he was different. Now, the smells, the sounds, and the horrors of Nordmade and the Low Way had already made their effects known, Argrave supposed, experiencing day after day of the horrible and the bizarre. He didn't dare think he was some sort of mentally untouchable Iron Man now, but the tasks ahead seemed less harrowing. Confronting the grim realities of the Low Way, morbid though they might be, might have served as the tempering he needed to continue. If I can survive this, I can handle anything, surely? Maybe this was a good thing, Argrave muttered straightening his back a little. A jolt to the system to wake me up. What? Annalise asked, not hearing Argrave. Nothing. He dismissed. Glimmon stepped out from one of the sluice control buildings, stepping up to Argrave. You said that was the last one? Should be, nodded Argrave, not looking away from the canal. The change in the water was not instantly perceptible. It continued to rush along its path, spattering the walls with wetness. Argrave noticed he saw more of the walls, first, and after, the constant flow of the water started to slow. Eventually, as more and more water came by, the flow ceased entirely, the water dispersing across the surface. The bottom of the canal was filthy, all sorts of twisted aquatic growth grew from the bottom, unpleasant crimson barnacles blocking most of the smooth stone. Much of the canal had eroded over the years from the constant rush of water, and the terrain was uneven and jagged, that, coupled with years of debris, made a very unpleasant and wet walkway. There were weapons and bones in abundance, likely from the corpses of guardians that had fallen into the canal. Argrave stopped leaning against the railing. There's our path. We should move quickly, and if someone raises the sluice, questioned Annalise, the remainder of the sentinels will emerge eventually. If they notice something amiss, the whole walkway isn't on the route of the canal, Argrave disclosed, walking up to a set of stairs leading down into the canal for maintenance. It branches off into a cave. This cave leads up to the Crimson Wellspring. Argrave looked at the sluice. Even if we're really unfortunate, and a tide of water comes rushing towards us. I suspect our B-rank wards in tandem should be enough to buy us time sufficient for an escape. Two wards against a tide of water? Gods, you're mental, Garm said from Annalise's hands, throwing everyone into danger time and time again. Perhaps I would have been better with the sentinels. Maybe, Argrave adjusted his pack, and then descended down into the canal below. We're at the final stretch. A fight awaits us. It's the one I told you two about, way back when we still had grass beneath our feet instead of corpses and gore. We're well prepared for it despite the setbacks we faced here. Argrave stopped a little down the stairs, glancing between Gilliman and Annalise. Let's finish this with the same caution we entered. The two of them nodded. Garm raised a disbelieving brow at the mention of caution but seemed somewhat relieved. With a quiet nod and as deep a breath as his scarred lungs would allow, Argrave stepped down the stairs, heading for the drained canal. Hash. In Dune gave me an ultimatum? Ilnor questioned, her legs crossed in her seat at the fountain. One could barely see the stumps where her two feet once were though they were mostly concealed by her unblemished white dress. He did, threes, Ilnor's new personal maid, replied. Evidently the orange-haired maid had been training her movements for some time, for she did not nod for her blind master as she had those weeks ago. He must be under great duress, Ilnor mused, placing her fingers on her chin. Despite Severan's reports, I am unsure of what he intends to achieve at Elbril. Will we do something about our grave, as he demanded? Threes questioned, and noticing that Ilnor's teacup was empty moved to refill it from the dainty white floral pot nearby. New tea, my princess. Be careful. It is still hot. I don't know where our grave is. Ilnor shook her head, then felt around until she placed her hands around the teacup, enjoying the warmth. He left just, and then, nothing. Elaine reported a shipment of books from some fringe town with an order branch. He is, fundamentally, an unpredictable variable. He claims to know me. Even of that, I am unsure. Then perhaps it would be best to allow Indune his way. Punish Argrave when he resurfaces, and stabilize things? Threes moved to suggest, having gained boldness being so close underneath Ilnor. Ilnor smiled. I told you that I wanted to create chaos. Shake the box. Ilnor held her fingers against the lip of the cup to ensure no liquid overflowed as she raised it to her mouth, then took a drink of the tea. We will do nothing to Argrave. Threes looked surprised, but said, Yes, my princess. But, why? Ilnor finished. Indune is growing to be just as unpredictable as Argrave. In times of peace, where none would dare oppose his activities. He was relatively stable. Now. The princess paused, placing her hands back on the teacup. Dot now, he faces widespread disobedience. For someone like him, I imagine that causes great mental stress. His impulsivity manifests more frequently, an unideal trait for someone aiding in my navigation. I. Cannot follow, my princess. Threes lowered her head. Provided our grave is not simply another victim of the coil of war. Ilnor took another slow drink. When he resurfaces, and should Undune grow incensed with him once again, I will merely quietly disclose his location. Nothing more, nothing less. To what end? To decide which unpredictability is worth supporting, 
Ilnor turned her head up at threes. If Undune should deem it necessary to reevaluate the worth my advice, I find it necessary to test if he is up for what comes ahead. Her thin hands clenched a little tighter on the teacup, turning her knuckles white. It is something I would never have considered, had he not said what he did. But, trust is a commodity, it seems, even between kin. Three stared down at the princess, her face sad. Then, Argrave. You believe he can prevail? Ilnor picked up the teacup, and then set it down once more. If they confront each other directly, it seems ridiculous. A prince, accompanied by royal knights, versus a bastard with known health problems. I know little of his two companions, but Elaine said he trusts them without compunction. He is smart, sidestepping and solving problems in a multitude of ways. In the face of all that, Indune is uncompromisingly relentless and a talented spellcaster and warrior both. We can only wait, Threes concluded. Ilnor said nothing and then nodded after a fair amount of time had passed. Yes, regardless of the result, it would be best not to latch too firmly to any one person. Ilnor crossed her arms. Disappointment is my sole companion, these days. On that note, my princess. Perhaps some good news is in order? Threes began. Two of the guards watching Bruno of Parban have folded under threat of family. While I suspect they will not do anything major, such as murder, we can get much out of them. The Margrave's brother is largely in our hands, my princess. Ilnor smiled then reached her hand out. I knew I was wise to trust you, Threes. Give me your hand. Threes took it, as directed. Trust is a fickle thing. It fades with the slightest infraction, and repairing it is much harder than building it. Remember this, always. Threes's face grew serious, interpreting the words as both a lesson and a warning. I will, my princess. Hash. Argrave, breathing a little heavy, stared at a mound of red crystals ahead. It was just barely illuminated by the spell light hovering over their heads. The canal had a low ceiling and the descent was quite steep. The overhang was just low enough that Argrave had to crouch a little to proceed, and if he was reckless, he could bang his head against the ceiling. The enchanted hood over his head had taken the brunt of his mistakes, but his head did ache a tad. Deciding that now might be a good time to rest a moment, Argrave looked back behind, seeing the path of the drained canal making its way back up into Nordmade. He gestured to the others and made a vague utterance signaling to stop. He searched for a safe place to rest, and then lowered himself onto a patch of stone unmarred by moss, barnacles, or other such generally detestable growth. Feeling a dull ache, he held his hand to his chest. Should have rested earlier, Gulliman said to Argrave, coming to stand over him. Traveling downhill is taxing when the terrain is uneven. This whole place is taxing, Argrave said in exasperation. He looked around, locking eyes with Garm. He was sorely tempted to make a joke about wanting to be carried, but he didn't want to lower the head's opinion of him more yet. Those crystals are familiar, said Garm from Annalise's hands. The work of blood magic. He continued. That's the cave, answered Dargrave without looking back. Not much further until the wellspring. Garm stared ahead. I'm glad, at least, I get to see it. Might be I can make sense of what happened here if I see it personally. Argrave felt his magic was full, so he repaid some of his debt to Earl of Nick. He took his pack off his back and retrieved a vial full of a black liquid magic from within. His supply of the stuff was running quite low. Once he made it to the burnt desert, he intended to make one more batch of liquid magic. After taking the time to rest fully, Argrave rose to his feet. They continued to trek downhill, moving ever closer towards the crystal mounds. They were ruby-like in quality, but quartz in structure. Despite the fact that they were the same eerie red predominant throughout all the low way, their beauty was some welcome reprieve from the bleak harshness of the overgrown city of Nordmade. Indeed. Nothing grew over top them, as through they warded off life. Here, Argrave pointed, spotting an opening in the crystals. He stepped towards it, taking the first step, an upward trek through this crystal cave. I hope you'll understand if I take it slowly. The scent of blood grows stronger ahead, the rotten blood in the canals, and something else. Sweet, rich, like wine, Glimmon said, inhaling deeply. The elven vampire pulled free a flask of blood, drinking, he had refilled it from the sentinel's corpses. I can't believe you fools travel with a vampire. Garm muttered, Argrave ignored him, that's good, we're heading towards the source, the crimson wellspring, there, we'll deal with Claude, grandmaster of the stone epital sentinels, or at least, he was, Argrave looked ahead, peering beyond into the cave, now, he's the current undead knight of the wellspring, keeping the thing pumping blood, Argrave turned back to the two of them, and he'll be the last, chapter 103, knight of the wellspring, Argrave steadily stepped up the jagged red crystals that bit at his boots, if there was one thing he had not expected to appreciate, it would be the enchanted boots. There was a limit to the level of comfort one could offer for footwear on earth, even with advanced technology. Here, though, despite the sharp, ruby-colored crystals sticking up into his soles, he felt nothing. The only pain he felt was from the gradual wear and tear of walking. The confines of the crystal cave were narrow and dark. There was a certain comfort to the narrowness. Argrave felt as though he was freed from the constant oppression that the openness of Nordmade provided. Back there, 
The vast open space and looming buildings made him feel as though something could swoop down at any moment and end him. Here, he felt walled. This came with its own set of problems, naturally, but they paled in comparison. You're sure this leads? Anywhere? Questioned Garm, voice unlabored. Yes, replied Argrave simply, finding himself annoyed by the head's presence. Perhaps it was simply jealousy Garm did not need to endure this trek as Argrave did. Ahead, the crystals cast eerie shadows like jagged teeth as the spell light dancing above Argrave's head illuminated the cave. They came to a branching path. Glimmon stopped, turning around and silently asking Argrave for direction. Argrave furrowed his brows, a bit uncertain. It was difficult to be certain the way he followed was right. It had been months since he'd been here in game. He looked for obvious identifiers, and then he spotted a faint difference in the constant red movement. Argrave knelt down and lowered his fingers. They came up red, and he felt an uncomfortable warmness seeping into his gloves. He followed the trickle of thick, viscous blood with his gaze, watching from where it flowed. We're close, I think. Just follow the flow, Argrave pointed, then wiped the blood off on his duster. Glimmon proceeded. The crystals started to grow from small, sharp things into large clumps, as though increasing in quality. At times, it made navigation a touch difficult, requiring uncomfortable stretching and twisting. Argrave had to stop the party to be sure his lungs were not overtaxed multiple times, yet their uncertain advance started to feel like genuine progress as the things around aligned themselves with Argrave's memories of heroes of Berinda. The crystals grew larger yet, until the floor beneath them solidified into one giant crystal. The space continued to open and Argrave greatly appreciated the opportunity to stand straight without fear of bumping his head against something. With it, though, came a whirling sense of nervousness and excitement both. With the night of the wellspring lying ahead, it felt finally time to test his practice, his efforts over the months he had been here. Gods! The sheer level of power needed to create crystals this, shut up, Argrave insisted in a whisper, turning back to Garm held in Annalise's hand. Make no noise. I told you a fight lies ahead, don't attract attention. Garm stared up at Argrave saying nothing. He turned his gaze away, and Argrave took that as acquiescence. Glimmon proceeded deeper into the red crystal cave, his metal boots ringing pleasantly against the ruby red crystals. Argrave could see the flow of blood beneath his feet grow thicker as they neared the crimson wellspring. Then, for the first time, there was a light ahead. Argrave stopped Annalise, cancelling his spell light and directing her to do the same. They proceeded onwards until the narrow cave opened up into a vast cavern, seeing a sight he remembered well. He took a deep breath as a strange sort of nostalgic awe rose in his chest. This place had once been a council room of sorts. It was a circular room with a high ceiling, held up by four pillars. Stone chairs were arrayed in a circle around the center, while a chair in the center of this circle stood above the others. The chairs were occupied with humanoid figures, it was difficult to distinguish their features from the faint light emanating from the center of the room. All of these things, though, had been supplanted by the crystalline growth identical to the caverns our grave had come from. The crystals partially covered the pillars as though reinforcing them. Many of the chairs were fully obscured by the crystals. The humanoid figures sat atop them encased in the ruby growth. In the center, the crimson wellspring floated, suspended in the air while emanating a bright red light that reflected off the surface of the crystals. The light made it difficult to make out its shape, yet a constant pour of blood emerged from it like water from a sink. In the back of the room, seated on the main chair elevated above the rest, a distinctly disparate figure sat. It was a knight in armor. A sash of stone roses hung across his chest marking him as a stone epatal sentinel. The stone roses had been turned into the same red crystals decorating the walls, though, and much of the armor was marred the same way, creating a rather ominous-looking ruby-gray set of armor. Claude, former Grand Master Sentinel, sat in the chair with all the vigor of a corpse, a mace leaning up against his leg. To call him a corpse was an apt comparison. He was a husk controlled by the wellspring, keeping it flowing until this day. His features could not be made out beneath the armor, but Argrave knew who it was. Argrave knelt down, pulling everyone down with him. There's our foe, the Knight of the Wellspring. Dot I have so many questions, murmured Annalise. You usually do, Argrave acknowledged. It'd be best if we stay focused, though. Right, she nodded after a long pause. Argrave removed his backpack, laying it against a safe spot as he spoke. If we step into the room, I'm sure he'll come alive. But, we have the initiative. To begin, Gilliman, Argrave pointed. You'll hit him with arrows enchanted with fire. His armor will negate most of the damage, but fire is especially effective against him. After this, you'll move up to meet him. I suggest bringing your ebon ice axe to dispel his blood magic and the dagger enchanted with flame for high damage. You told me never to contest his strength, that he was much stronger than me, Glimmon said, looking at Argrave as he removed his own pack. I'll use my great sword in the other hand, the dagger. I need to get too close. An ideal if the opponent is stronger and faster than me, as you claim. Argrave nodded. You'd know best. He looked to Annalise who had also set aside her pack for the fight. You and me, we'll stick close, near one of the pillars. Easier to take cover. We can watch each other's backs, conjure be rank wards if needed. From there, you aid Gilliman. Sky Sunder, will be best here, fast, potent, 
perfect for Claude. You'll see why I insisted you learn lightning elemental magic first. Meanwhile, I'll do my thing. Annalise nodded. She raised Garm up. Should I? Argrave stared down at Garm. Leave him someplace safe. He's another variable, unpredictable, and I hadn't really expected to. Well, make use of him, even if he can help. Garm pursed his lips, then closed his eyes. Won't complain at this arrangement. Annalise moved to do as Argrave had suggested perching Garm in an area that he was facing upright. Argrave took the time to stare at Claude. Watching the Knight of the Wellspring sitting there, immobile, made him wish to rush in and start things, if only for the sake of dispelling his unease. But eventually, Annalise returned, Garm placed a fair distance away. Argrave looked between the two of his companions. Listen, the only way I can see this going sour is if someone gets hasty. You two are damned smart, and I'd want no one else by my side, so I don't see that happening. Still, just to reiterate, we stick to what we discussed. Any questions, uncertainties? Now's the time. Argrave moved his head between the two of them, waiting. When nothing came, he took a deep breath, the dull ache of pain in his chest serving to ground him to reality. Annalise, let's move to the pillars. Once we're there, I'll begin, finished Gilliman, already readying an arrow that shone with red light on its arrowhead. Argrave gave a wordless nod in return, then touched Annalise's shoulder to get her attention. They moved along the edge of the room. Annalise watching the bodies encased within the crystal with an insatiable curiosity even amidst the tension. Argrave knelt up beside the crystal encased stone pillar and spared a glance at Gilliman before refocusing on the Knight of the Wellspring. Annalise just beside him. Wait until I direct you to attack, Argrave whispered to Annalise. Annalise had a complex spell matrix in hand, ready to attack at a moment's notice. Argrave, though, had something else in mind. He held both of his hands out, and eels of blue lightning emerged from his hand dancing up into the sky in a spiral. Though he lacked the blessing of Erlebne, their plan involved the usage of electric eel. His magic alone would be sufficient. He suspected, it merely lacked a safety net. Now, the few seconds of tense quietude set our grave's heart beating faster every second. A twang sounded out in the soundless cavern, and a flaming arrow coursed out through the center of the room. It struck into the visor of the helmet, and Argrave could not help but be awed at the elf's marksmanship in spite of the situation. Despite the arrow jutting out of its face, the Knight of the Wellspring immediately sprung to life. It fell forward, sending the mace leaning against its legs rolling out across the floor. Claude rolled, then came to his feet in a fluid motion. He pulled free the bloodied arrow, casting it aside, then held both of his hands out. The flowing stream of blood pouring from the Wellspring diverted its course, surging through the air as though alive. It split near Claude's hands, gradually coalescing into two twin blades simple broadswords with flat heads. Without a word, the Knight of the Wellspring rushed forth, metal boots ringing against the red crystals beneath its feet. Glimmon had prepared another arrow and loosed it at its charge. The Knight slowed, doing a pivot spin on one foot to dodge the arrow with supernatural speed. Glimmon set his bow aside, grabbing his ebon ice axe and his great sword. He stepped forth to meet it. When the two were perhaps ten feet from each other, Argrave said, Annalise. Loudly, two white bolts of lightning shot out from Annalise's hand across the room blinding with light and deafening with sound. Both hit home, striking the Knight of the Wellspring soundly in two points. The undead knight spasmed, and Gilliman swung his great sword with one hand. A blade of wind closed the gap, yet Claude still managed to block the attack with his blades. Blood from the blades scattered over his armor, loosed by the attack's intensity. When the knight recovered, it threw one of its blades at Annalise, and Argrave ducked behind the pillar, pulling Annalise with him. The blade shattered against the pillar, creating a foot-deep gash in the stone and scattering blood against the wall. The blood dripped down, yet then began to bubble, surging back through the air towards the Knight of the Wellspring. Claude started to move towards their position, yet Gilliman placed himself in its path, swinging his sword once more. Argrave continued to use, Electric Eel, feeling his magic diminish as he prepared. He kept the spells just out of sight. A cloud of dancing blue electricity hovered behind the pillars, a lurking leviathan of lightning. Gilliman kept Claude locked in combat, using his enchanted blade to maintain a cautious distance. The Knight blocked and dodged blow after blow with its one sword. But when the second blade of blood reformed in its hand, it rushed at Gilliman, keeping a low profile. When the two grew near, Argrave emerged from the pillar, seeking an opportunity. The knight swept its left hand, cutting horizontally, and Gilliman barely dodged. The second blade descended in a dreadful overhead blow. Gilliman swung the ebon ice axe, meeting the attack. Once the black ice met the blade of blood, it bubbled before dispersing, pouring over Gilliman's armor ineffectually. The axe continued, striking the knight of the wellspring in the helmet. It staggered rolling away with an animalistic haste. With distance between the two, Annalise shot out another volley of, sky sunder, from each hand. The knight had been anticipating her attack, and though it tried to dodge, the raw speed of the magic still managed to strike it. One bolt missed, impacting with a red crystal just behind it. Seeing Annalise as a threat, the knight of the wellspring broke off from Gilliman, rushing towards them with a single-minded purpose. Argrave smiled, 
clenching his hands. Gulliman rushed across the room as fast as he could, yet the night of the wellspring was much, much faster. Annalise waited, hands at the ready, yet cast no spells. She waited, watching, with Argrave doing the same. Once the creature was near, it leapt, and Annalise conjured a B-rank ward with her enchanted ring. The two blades of blood stabbed into the golden ward, breaking past them. Argrave conjured his own ward with his ring. The attack's momentum was diminished from the first ward, and the blades bounced back. Just then, Argrave willed the spells he'd prepared down. The Knight of the Wellspring looked up and frantically tried to move away, but the close proximity removed that option. Near twenty, electric eels, surged down, their high-pitched sparking sounding like myriad war cries, and the knight danced with light and electricity as the enchanted armor it wore shone to protect its wearer. Annalise, too, bombarded the creature with, sky sunder. As it struggled with their relentless barrage, Gulliman caught up. He raised his great sword, thrusting the Krigsmesser into the back of the knight's neck, pushing down into its torso. The blow was savage enough to force the knight of the wellspring to its knees, cracking the crystal beneath it. Gulliman pulled his blade free, blades of wind scattering everywhere, and stabbed once more. He twisted the blade, and then freed it of the abominable undead. The undead clawed knelt there, still sparking with electricity from their earlier assault. The swords of blood in its hands began to melt, falling to the floor. The knight of the wellspring slowly collapsed against the ground, scattering crystals into the air. Blood started to pour from every hole in its armor, as though a dam had just been broken. Dot it's over. Argrave said, leaning against the pillar. He started to laugh in triumph. Chapter 104, End of the Long Night Ossian leaned over a railing, staring down at the drained bottom of one of the canals. Despite having traversed the low way since he was but twelve in secret expeditions away from the senior sentinel's eyes, Ossian had not known the canals had a portion that could be dried entirely with the sluices. Why it was drained, or where the dried portion led, Ossian did not care to test. That would be a journey for another day, if indeed it came at all. Dot it's been a day. Ossian, rations are running low, and we can only forage the plants in Nord made for so long without straying dangerously far from the main group, a spellcaster advised Ossian. Ossian did not look behind as he questioned, and no word, no sightings of Alistair. One of the sentinels in Alistair's group confessed that he left a search for that severed head in Argrave's possession, the spellcaster disclosed. Ossian nodded, lowering his head and slouching against the railing. It was impossible to discern what had happened to Alistair with no evidence. That said, the circumstances moved together to leave no doubt in his mind. His own experience in the low way told him something, too, those lost in the low way rarely return if gone for more than a day. As his thoughts crystallized, Ossian lifted his head and straightened his back. It would be best to accept that he's lost to us now, just as those that went with him, Ossian said, voice neutral. He had never liked Alistair, but the old man had seemed immutable. That he might be gone forevermore disquieted him more than he cared to admit. It's time to give the order to return, Ossian said, stepping away. We'll gather everyone do account, and, Ossian paused mid-step, something having caught his eyes, he stepped away slowly, walking to the other side of the stone platform they stood on, he stared at another, separate canal that still ran with water far below, his brows furrowed, it seems, he began, not finishing his thought, he followed the route of the canal with his eyes, the blood-red water changed in tone as his gaze wandered, from a dark, rich and gloomy red, to a faint pink, his eyes followed it all the way up, and then, for the first time, he saw clean, White water emerge from one of the canals. Gods. Ossian placed a gauntleted hand on his helmet, feeling like the whole world was spinning. The rivers. The blood. The spellcaster stepped up beside Ossian, staring out into the distance. For the first time in their memory, both of the sentinels witnessed the blood constantly dripping from the walls slow and cease altogether. Despite all that happened, Ossian gripped the railing tightly. He knew some vampires escaped. He ended their long night, cutting off their eternal sustenance. No more will they live forever sustained by the bloody rivers of the low way. A fragment of stone chipped off the railing, drawing Ossian away from his thoughts. Ossian stepped away, looking around the once grand city of Nordmade. The true heir of Vaskar ended the night of withering once and for all, and after death. There is growth. He looked to the spellcaster. We must return, bearing good news on two counts, as for Alistair. He died valiantly to vampires, nothing more. Hash. Argrave held the crimson wellspring in his hand. The light it projected had diminished greatly but it still shone brightly enough. The crimson wellspring was a ring of black metal with a diameter of about a foot. The ring itself was as thick as Argrave's thumb. Eight resplendent red gems rested along its circumference equidistantly, each connected by shimmering red runes that formed long-lost enchantments. Its constant downpour of blood had ceased. I can make no sense of the thing, said Garm, leaning up against one of the pillars with the back of his head supporting him up. This wellspring is beyond my ken, I admit, even were I not severely out of practice. Argrave nodded having not expected much to begin with. His eyes wandered, witnessing Annalise knelt down beside the corpse of the Knight of the Wellspring. Her thick braid of white hair was matted with blood, which may have worried Argrave had he not known she was uninjured. Your spell, 
Electra Keel. Annalise turned her head to Argrave. I see its uses, even when you do not use your blessing. Argrave nodded. Yeah, used all my magic, though, and didn't even kill the knight. Glamon had to finish him off. Argrave turned his gaze to the elven vampire, who cleaned his armor and axe while leaning against a pillar. Those people encased in the crystal, Argrave began, looking around. They're high wizards of the Order of the Rose. Right, Garm? Garm's black eyes darted round. Aye, they are, each and every one. All dead and gone. The bastard who made me like this. Can't find him, unfortunately. No such luck, he veritably spat. Then you know all I do, Annalise, about the Night of Withering, about the Night of the Wellspring. Argrave looked to her. Any more questions? Yes, she stood. This crimson wellspring, how did he feed it? Anything living? Or one's living, I suppose. Corpses, foliage. The night of the wellspring would roam into the lower way, hunting down things. Bodies sustained it the best. Argrave held his hands out, staring at the wellspring in his hands. Even despite that, Claude never roamed Nordmade, or the other northern sections. He never killed any sentinel. Some distant vestige of his remaining consciousness, maybe fighting the husk that the wellspring made him. Annalise placed one hand on her hip, staring down at the body of Claude. And what is the night of the wellspring? The night of the wellspring? Argrave repeated. There's only so much I know about it. I know the wellspring itself chooses them, it selects from the bodies fed to it. Other than that, this whole place is just a mound of mysteries, uncertainties. There are no records. Nothing left to tell the story. The wellspring sounds dangerous, concluded Annalise, stepping away from Claude's corpse. It's inactive, now. Argrave assured, lifting his head up to look past her. Something about this room empowers it, amplifies it, especially in the center. The crystals may have that effect, Garm contributed, his eyes closed. They're born of blood magic. It stands to reason there's a resonance. I don't know. Argrave shook his head. He held a hand out. Help me up. Please. Annalise helped him to his feet, and Argrave muttered a thanks. He looked around the room, I think. We should sleep, Argrave concluded, rubbing his eyes with his hands. Feels like it's been dozens of hours since I last did that. Argrave looked to Glamon and Annalise, who both nodded in agreement. Tomorrow, we have a straight shot to reach the burnt desert. Claude spent all this time hunting in that area, it should be safer than Nordmade. The prospect of entering the burnt desert made Argrave feel like the path that stretched ahead of him was unending. He hadn't felt this way for some time. He moved to his backpack fishing through it before he finally pulled free the bronze hand mirror. He kept its surface facing towards the ground, instead staring at the carvings on its back. He ran his finger along them, feeling their surface. The sight of the bronze hand mirror reminded Argrave he had promised to be honest with his companions once this was over. God damn it, he muttered to himself, lightly bashing his head against the back of the mirror. Don't think I'm sleeping easy tonight, he accepted. Too much to think about. Hash. Argrave lowered himself down from his gaping hole. His grey leather duster scraping against the red crystals beneath him. He fell a fair distance, perhaps five feet, and then impacted with a stone, kneeling. He straightened, shaking his legs, then stepped forward to allow those behind him to follow. Annalise held out Garm, and Argrave took him to free up her hands. He offered his other hand to support her way down, which she used minimally. Once she had stepped out the way, Glamon jumped down quickly and gracefully. He moved more adeptly than they did. Despite wearing plate armor, Argrave handed Garm back to Annalise and looked around. This place brought back memories. It was near identical in appearance to the tunnel that they had entered the lower way from. Tall ceilings, thorns decorating the walls, with roses of stone winding about the walls and ceiling, and wide stairs that made it awkward to ascend quickly. I can hear the wind, Glamon said. Best damn thing you could have said, Argrave said with a smile, stepping forth and gesturing those with him to do the same. His spell light followed him, and as he proceeded, he started to make out faint light in the distance. He had been expecting blinding sunlight, yet that was not what he got. Instead, pearly white moonlight shone through. Argrave contained himself, being sure not to throw his caution to the wind at the home stretch. The walk seemed unbearably long, and his hands were twitching the whole way, but soon enough the smell of the air grew fresher, almost sweeter, and he felt the wind at his cheeks. Argrave stepped out of the low way, his heart beating faster than it had in the battle with the night of the wellspring. A wave of cold wind met his cheeks and he took in the vast expanse of the burnt desert before him. It seemed as though he was at the end of the skies, two vast expanses of dark stretching out into eternity both up and down, the starry skies on the top, a vast carpet of black sand on the bottom. The sand was dark enough that it seemed nothing was ahead of them, just an abyss. There was a beauty to it, yet at the same time, there was a horror belying that beauty. Argrave stepped forward, feeling as though his feet could hit nothing. When his grey leather boots sunk into sand, he fell to his knees, grasping it like a madman. He started to laugh and then looked back. Smell that? It's air, he said, eyes wide. Normal air, not goddamn red lung ridden air that smells like piss, blood, and whatever other foul tripe in that hell. Argrave pointed up, a sky above us, 
instead of redness and stone. Nothing lurking in the shadows, ready to jump at us. Everyone was a bit emotional, even Gilliman, like some great burden had been lifted from them all. Garm had tears in his eyes, though he blinked quickly to dispel them. Argrave threw sand into the air, uncaring when it fell on him. He lowered his head, giggling like a maniac, then rose to his feet. He took a deep breath of fresh air, ignoring his aching lungs. Let's enjoy this moment until the suns rise. Chapter 105, Two Stars Consume the Darkness. Argrave, Annalise, and Gilliman sat around a faintly flickering spell. Garm was there, too, though considering he was stabbed into the sand upright, he wasn't exactly sitting. Despite being the middle of the night at the end of fall, the temperature was quite pleasant. In the burnt desert, the heat would linger in the sand for a long time after the sun set both because of its color and its composition. Gilliman did nothing. He had done all of the maintenance he needed for his weapons and armor the night before. He simply stared at the spell light in silence, legs crossed and boots sinking into the somewhat cold black sand beneath them. Annalise did just the same. Though she might have busied herself with reading in the past, it seemed even she had to surrender herself to the whim of relaxation at times. She braided her now clean white hair idly. Argrave, though found it difficult to be consumed by the same spirit of relaxation. His brain was consumed with a veritable whirlwind of thoughts, foremost above them a simple fact. He had promised to be honest with the people here. He couldn't deny he didn't want to. Refusing to let his guard down would be much easier, and probably much more manageable, than telling the truth as he understood it. And indeed, he could probably worm his way out of this one. He had many excuses, Garm's presence, for one. After much introspection, Argrave came to realize something. It wasn't a lack of trust. He was confident Gilliman and Annalise would keep his secrets until the end of days, if need be. He didn't suspect they would abandon him, cast him aside. They had proven time and time again that they were in this to the bitter end. The issue, then, did not rest with them. It rested within himself. Argrave didn't want to tell them where his knowledge came from. But he wished they knew. He valued them beyond simply tools best suited to ending Gerectic Kiet. Argrave couldn't deny he enjoyed lying. Perhaps that was why it came so naturally to him. But his life experience both here and on earth had taught him constant deception boded poorly for any relationship, be it as friends or otherwise. With this in mind, Argrave raised his head and looked up into the starry sky, where the bright red moon neared the horizon. He took a deep breath and sighed. Garm, Argrave said, lowering his head. Annalise has told you what the purpose of our journey is, right? In rough terms, the head replied, unable to nod in confirmation. With that in mind, Argrave looked at him as serious as he'd ever been. Dot will you set aside any notion of benefits and demerits, any self-interest, and freely share with us what you know? Garm's black and gold eyes stayed locked onto our grave. His face was as immovable as stone, and the only sound that could be heard was the howling of the desert wind against the towering mountain above them. No, our grave nodded, expression disappointed. I have always been a man of logic and reason, not to fairy tales about the world's end, Garm continued voice cold. What superstitions tribal elves hold has no bearing on my reasoning. If you wish for my knowledge, I expect to return. The girl has promised my protection, and you have agreed to that condition. Until something else comes along, that is the extent of our cooperation. And if you see irrefutable evidence? Argrave continued. Dot I don't know what I'd do, Garm admitted. I won't say no. Reasonably, I should say yes. If the evidence is irrefutable, then as long as you refuse to trust in this group, I cannot include you in this next conversation. Argrave shook his head adjusting his sitting position. Garm took that in for a long while, finally closing his eyes. So be it. Argrave nodded, turning his head back towards Annalise and Gilliman. They both stared at him, expressions passive. Argrave thought there was a certain seriousness to their expressions, though, they understood that Argrave had finally made up his mind. Argrave held a hand out, as he rank matrix swirling in his hand. A large ward spread out slowly, enveloping the three of them. The sounds of the desert stopped, and they were left alone with each other. Garm kept his eyes closed just beyond the ward as though refusing to even look at them as they spoke. Don't know where to begin, Argrave said. He rubbed his gloved hands together. Let me just say what I'm thinking, cut past all the filters I put over my words. I don't really want to do this at all. Been dreading it. I feel idiotic. He brought his knees up, then bunched them together with his arms. Annalise and Gilliman waited silently. But I can't imagine you two wanted to go through the low way, or the cavern of the lily's death before that. Yet you did. You placed your trust in this wise ass sitting right here. Argrave pointed to himself. I owe you an explanation, I think. But beyond just owing you, I guess I care about you, and what you think of me. I don't know. Argrave shook his head, somewhat embarrassed by his bumbling. Up until some months ago, Argrave continued quickly, ignorant of the exact date, this place, Berenda, Veiden, everything around me. It was fictional. It was as fake as a fairy tale, made up people, places, cities, happenings. Think of it like a book, or a, a live theater. He grasped for concepts they'd understand. Evidently the conversation had not gone the way either expected, for both donned perplexed expressions. Unlike a book, though, I could, well, 
Anyone could, interact with, and change the direction of the story, Argrave outlined. I would. He paused, thinking. I would interact with this world via an avatar. A proxy. I would take control of something living in this fictional world, and with it, do what I wanted, hunt monsters, go on grand quests. And, well, fight Gerectic Kiet. It was a game. Argrave turned his head away. Having trouble keeping eye contact with them, in the distance, he saw the first beam of light come up over the mountain, illuminating the vast dark landscape of the burnt desert. You could experience this world. Through a proxy? Gulliman questioned. Argrave nodded. Yes, I existed in this world, through proxy, thousands of times. The time frame of my control over this avatar was limited to a few years, three and a half years before Gerectic Kiet being the starting point, and Gerectic Kiet's defeat being the ending. But were you? Well, were you? Annalise began, unable to vocalize her question. Argrave tried to predict her question, saying, about three months ago, I guess, I woke up as Argrave. Fiction became reality. He finished, nodding and looked into the distance. The light continued to rise further yet, dispelling the shadow over the dark sand. There was a long, long silence, the longest yet. How? Huh? Annalise finally broke the quiet. Argrave didn't answer, watching the sunlight slowly creep along the desert. Finally, he turned away from the scene. I don't know. Nothing could be said in response to that, Argrave suspected, for both grew quiet. Argrave elaborated, continuing, I woke up, in a body that wasn't my own, three months ago. I knew who Argrave was, but he wasn't me. This world, which I perceived as fiction, gained detail, gained depth, and became my reality. Argrave paused to gather his thoughts. From there, I confronted two facts. Gerectic Kiet was coming and I might be the only one capable of stopping it. That realization made me set aside all this existential nonsense. Even now, I don't really want to talk about it. Don't want to think about it. This is difficult to wrap my head around. Annalise placed both hands on her temples. Why are you the only capable of stopping Gerectic Kiet? Gulliman questioned. When I played the game with my avatar, some details remained consistent. Argrave stared at Gilliman. In this world, my avatar was the one who stopped Gerectic Kiet, and in this world, my proxy always possessed one item. Argrave pulled over his backpack, rustling through it. He pulled out the bronze hand mirror. I would always possess this mirror. Argrave briefly caught a glimpse of it. Traits, tall, sickly, weak, intelligent, magic of inity, high, insomniac, blessing of supersession, max, skills, elemental magic, C, blood magic, C, healing magic, C, illusion magic, D, warding magic C, druidic magic, C, inscription, E, imbuing, E. Annalise stared at Argrave, simultaneously enlightened by his mention of the mirror and confused by the entire situation. All right, that's the best I've got for explanations. Now, ask me questions. Help me make you understand. That's the only way we can salvage this mess, I think. In the distance, the twin suns finally began to rise over the blackness of the burnt desert, shrouding the desolate landscape of blackness in the bright and warm light of a new dawn. Hash. Argrave found the entire conversation very unpleasant, but then, Argrave reasoned there were many things in life that were unpleasant yet ultimately beneficial. Cleaning out a wound with alcohol, for instance, was excruciating, letting an infection fester was far worse. Of course, his analogy to assuage his discomfort quickly fell flat when he acknowledged the existence of healing magic. Nevertheless, Argrave answered all Gulliman and Annalisa's questions for hours as the suns rose ever higher into the air, dispelling what chill had taken the desert at night. The more questions he answered, the more they had, it seemed a never-ending cycle, and yet things did eventually come to a close, in large part due to Argrave's voice giving out. Argrave stared out into the vastness of the burnt desert, Gulliman standing just beside him. A lot of things about you make sense, now, Gulliman commented. Yeah? Argrave pressed. Yet even more has stopped making sense. Yeah, Argrave repeated. A strong wind blew across the desert, sending black particles drifting through the air. I've realized something, Argrave said. What? Gulliman looked to Argrave. We don't have much food. Argrave gazed out into the empty sandscape, eyes unfocused. Gulliman exhaled from his nose loudly, as close to a laugh as the elf got. The nearest place. It's pretty far, Argrave said neutrally. Don't worry, said Gulliman. Argrave looked at him, hopeful the elf had an idea. If you collapse, I can carry you both. He patted Argrave's shoulder. Yeah, that's because we're your emergency food. Argrave sighed. They stood in silence, letting the wind wash over them. Annalise stepped up beside Argrave standing opposite Gilliman. What you told us. I hope you know that your secret will remain with us, Annalise began. Was never worried about that. Argrave shook his head. I know you too well, Gilliman more so, but you dot I know enough. I told you from the beginning. You are a person of good character. He looked at her. Just didn't want to think about it. And I didn't want to ruin things. Too much at stake to do so. She nodded passively, evidently lost in thought. After a time, she lifted her head. Do you dislike being here? 
Annalise questioned. I don't dislike the desert. Argrave shook his head. Magic removes all of its inconveniences. During winter, it might be the best time to be here. Of course. If you thought Vasco was despotic, you haven't been to the burnt desert. The powers that be control every facet of life here, and they're slowly whittling away any resistance. That is not what I meant. Annalise looked at Argrave. Do you dislike being Argrave? Argrave raised a brow, a bit taken aback by her question. He looked around, being sure Garm was not near. Seeing that he wasn't, Argrave let himself be lost in thought. I like this place, Argrave reluctantly said. I love its cultures, its people, and its history. I spent years playing the game for those reasons, Argrave admitted. I like the idea of being here. Magic fascinates me. Discovering things, secrets, about Berenda. Even now, it does excite me. But thus far, I think you can know my feelings just looking at me. Annalise nodded. Argrave, she said. Argrave looked over. His grey eyes locking with hers. You will win again. When all is said and done, and when the world is settled. You will have freedom. Bold claim, Missy. We haven't even crossed this desert without dying. Argrave pointed to the sandscape with his thumb, keeping his gaze locked on her amber eyes. She merely smiled at him. Her eyes were strangely sad, Argrave thought. Eventually, he looked out across the desert, unable to maintain the eye contact. Let's worry about winning later. After we cross the desert, we have to dance around in a despotic regime directly responsible for climate change. After that low way, it'll be nice to have some fun in the sun. Argrave held a hand out, blocking out the two suns. He felt like a mess. His chest still ached. He had a terrible headache, and he couldn't stop simply thinking. Yet for the first time since he had come here, he didn't feel entirely alone. Chapter 106, and the march goes on. What do you think? Annalise stared at Gulliman, her arms crossed expectantly. Gulliman turned around, looking to where our grave had gone briefly to take care of nature's call. Doesn't matter. I didn't need answers. I had already resolved to follow him. Gulliman shook his head. But I want to know what you think, Annalise insisted. Gulliman ground his teeth together, saying nothing as the wind blew across the desert. I'm reminded of when I was young, and I questioned the meaning of life and the validity of Vade's teachings. I'm wrought with the same sort of existential ponderance. So you believe our grave? She queried. His white eyes turned to her. You do, he noted. That is sufficient for me. You're a reliable gauge for lies and deception. I've come to know that. She nodded. I know, at least, he believes what he says. His knowledge, too, is without question, as for what he revealed to us. She knelt down, her hair falling to the sand. It challenges many of my preconceptions about the world. I have many questions to ask. What do you mean, he believes what he says? Gulliman looked down at her. Annalise looked up at Gulliman rising back to her feet. He, himself, knows nothing of what actually happened to him. This. This other world that he described to us. She rubbed her hands together. Maybe it is real. But the gods work incomprehensibly. If the gods did indeed meddle, why would they place him in a shackled body? Much is uncertain. It'll never be certain. Myself, I believe it is Vade's will. Gulliman nodded. I hate uncertainty. I hate being ignorant. Annalise shook her head. Though it may be beyond my ken to know now. It must not always be so. When the threat of Gerectic Kiet does not loom, I think it would be fun to pursue the answer to his question. For now, I will continue on at his side. Now that he has finally cracked, perhaps I can finally learn something genuine about him. He is quite a dodgy one, refusing to answer questions about himself, who he was before. I have to change that. It will come with time. Ha! Huh. Gulliman laughed, scratching his chin. Annalise gazed up at him, head tilted in curiosity. You're feeling nostalgic. Gulliman's mirth ceased when his emotions were so accurately placed. He shook his head as though dismissing his emotions. It is nothing. Merely reminded of my youth. How so? Unimportant. Just something you said reminded me of what she... Well, never mind. Gulliman closed his eyes. Want some advice on people like him? How to open his shell? Her eyes grew eager. You have some? Be patient. Be present. Gulliman disclosed, opening his eyes and gazing out into the distance. He keeps his thoughts, his doubts, close. Hates to display them outwardly. I know that. She nodded. It's why he jokes, makes light of himself. One day, he'll hit a wall, Gulliman crossed his arms. That'll be your chance to get some honesty from him. And more, Gulliman smiled faintly. Is this what you've been trying? Gulliman's smile quickly turned into a frown. No. This is a tactic for you. Annalise looked perplexed, and Gulliman uncrossed his arms, continuing, at the very least. It is reassuring that Argrave has done this before. Annalise raised a brow. Can it be considered the same? Gulliman looked to her. There is a difference between a fresh recruit who has done nothing, and one who has spent hours beating a training dummy. At the very least, the latter has a feel for what must be done. Possibly. I think not many could do what Argrave has done. Thus far, Annalise posited. Maybe. Maybe not, Gulliman responded indecisively. He is definitely uniquely equipped for the path he's on. Hash. Argrave crested the top of a black dune of sand placing his hands on his knees to catch his breath. He conjured and drank water, appreciating the moisture amidst the incredibly dry air. Gulliman was already waiting at the top, 
staring out across the land. Argrave wore something different than yesterday, his set of black leather he had purchased from the craftswoman at Jast. It was lighter and much more breathable than the fur-lined grey set he'd worn. The few pieces of metal on it were brass, faded so as not to reflect light. It was made to cover his body much better, too, preventing the coarse black sand from entering into his boots or any crevices. Above all, Argrave was clean again. He was getting better about tolerating uncleanliness, yet he did appreciate removing the blood and dirt stained grey leather outfit that had traversed the entire low way without much washing. Annalise caught up with Argrave, stabbing gum into the sand. Dot I believed it was ridiculous to bring black leather to a desert, Annalise confided, only barely out of breath. Yet it is not as scorching as I imagined, and this is pleasant, like the hottest summer day in Vaiden. The clothes breathe well yet keep me warm. She pulled at her sleeves. Argrave considered this as he stared down at the black sand, hunched over breathless. The night and dawn both had been somewhat chilly, yet during the day, a pleasant temperature prevailed, maybe only because it was on the cusp of winter, granted. That said, the burnt desert was not without its issues. The sand was heavy and abrasive, making walking more difficult than Argrave expected. The air was incredibly dry. In addition, the ground could grow very hot at times. Fortunately, they had not yet encountered a sandstorm. Dot I would come here during the winter, at times. Garm said idly. Argrave glanced at him, still catching his breath, and then rose to his feet. He conjured water in his hands, drinking it quickly. Quite frankly, Argrave didn't know what to make of the severed head that they had taken from the low way of the rose. It was true that Garm had likely saved Argrave's life, that said, he did not exactly hide his intents. He was extremely pessimistic, but above all, Argrave knew nothing about Garm. Garm had been a key item to unlock the lower levels, beyond the initial encounter, one did not engage with him further. He, like hundreds of other key items, languished in the player's inventory, never to be thought about again. Yet now he was here. Annalise had sworn to protect the thing, though she had made it clear that the other members of the party would take precedence over his life. The deal had seemed incredibly obvious at the time, yet as things proceeded, Argrave was not entirely sure he could trust Garm at all. Never been more grateful for magic, Argrave spoke, dismissing his thoughts for now. Things get too hot, you can cool yourself down. Thirsty, conjure water, sandstorm, warded off. All the dangers of this place are shooed away by one mage. Yet it cannot stay exhaustion, noted Annalise. Yeah, Argrave agreed idly. My point is, magic is the best tool for this place. It's the supreme power. You catch what I mean? He looked at Annalise. I. Annalise paused, head tilted in thought. Oh, she nodded as the answer came to her. You mentioned a faction has an iron grip over this region. Do you mean to say that they are mages? In a sense, people have baseline needs. If you control those needs, you control the populace. And mages can do that, here, at least. They have, Argrave mended, realizing this situation could be applicable elsewhere. A lot of unscrupulous people abound here, willing and able to do whatever they need to get power. Who? Questioned Garm. There's no centralized power, but they're all part of the same faction, more or less. The vessels of Felhorn the god of floods and rain. These vessels are probably the only surviving group still worshipping an ancient god. You're kidding, said Garm. Argrave turned to look at him. The vessels of Felhorn. They were a minor group. The Order of the Rose employed their aid in making the canals of the low way. They're masters of water, nothing more. Weren't you listening? Argrave questioned. Yeah. They are masters of water. People need to drink water to live. You realize it's only natural their prominence would increase in this place. Argrave waved his hands around. Couple that with some ruthless practices and things progress as you might expect. You want to drink water? That's fine, they say, as long as you submit to us, we'll give it to you. For a small group, that's unsustainable, largely, any wandering mage can do the same. But while you've been indisposed, Argrave waved to Garm awkwardly, they've been growing in prominence. From a position of power, they can control all the water in a given region. Any mage that disagrees, they're hunted and killed. Non-mages submit to the vessels, or they die of thirst. The vessels make sure of that. Oases, wells, springs, they dry up, only the water in Felhorn's domain persists, sounds effective, I suppose, said Gilliman with a nod, might be, but most figureheads in the vessels are nothing more than regional despots, reveling in the luxury brought by their authority rather than using it for progress, Argrave shook his head, like this, the savage southern tribes are brought to heal, the south run elves, the barbaric cannibals that battled against House Parban since the house existed, reduced to little more than thralls because they lack options. Vasca's greatest threat for centuries extinguished by attrition, eroded from within. Argrave took a deep breath and sighed. I'm getting worked up for nothing. I'm not. We're not here to take a stance. When it comes to fighting Gerectic Kiet it serves no benefit to get involved here. Lot of death, lot of misery. And at the end of it all, very little that would aid in the fight against Gerectic Kiet. I see. All that said. Are you expecting trouble? Annalise queried, the vessels won't cause trouble for travelers like us, even if we are mages, bothering wanderers might disrupt their peace, as long as we don't make trouble, there'll be none, 
no giving water to the thirsty, things like that. Argrave smiled, coincidentally, I do have to make some, so. Yes, I am expecting trouble, but not much, only enough to get what I need. Annalise crossed her arms, I do hope you will inform us before acting. Of course, I've learned my lesson, Argrave said seriously. Now that my cat's out of the bag, so to speak, I'll tell you too everything. Without reservation, he pushed the thoughts aside, finally ready to move again. In the far distance, movement caught Hargrave's eye. He saw what looked like a black ball rolling downhill. The familiar sight made him smile. It was an armadillo-like creature, near the size of a boar, that supposedly hunted the bugs native to the burnt desert. To conserve energy, it rolled down the dunes. A sirolo, Hargrave pointed with his finger. Cute little thing. It should suffice, Glimmer nodded shaking some sand out of his gauntlets. Suffice? Glimmon looked at Argrave. We won't make it to this town you spoke of. I can see the tower in the distance. But we aren't traveling fast enough. The rolling creature came to a stop, the black mammal emerging from its ball and starting to move up another dune in a slow waddle. That Cyrilo creature should suffice for tonight's food. Argrave's smile quickly faded, but he didn't exactly protest. The alternative is bugs, Glimmon said coldly, observing Argrave's expression. I didn't say anything. Argrave raised his hands. Chapter 107, Sullied Marble. Argrave's boots met something other than sand for the first time in a long while. The ground beneath his feet was still black, though it resembled baked clay more than sand, and some sparse few plants sprouted from cracks in the soil. They were yellow or grey, though, all dead and decaying. The air was dry to the point Argrave wished to keep his mouth shut constantly. Ahead, the vast dunes of sand began to fade away if only for a brief bit. The first bit of civilization entered into sight, a giant wall of black clay. It was smooth and strong, standing about thirty feet tall. Argrave could just barely see the leaf of a palm tree poking over the walls, though, instead of green, it was black and purple. Maybe we can get a wyvern while we're here, spare me an awful return hike. Argrave placed his hand on his back, whatever. We made it. This place is called Delphasium. Argrave turned around to his two companions. Glimmon held calm. This time, Though they had worked out a disguise for the severed head, he had been stuck in the back of Glimmon's pack and wore the elf's helmet. It was far too large, but it hid his existence in a mostly convincing manner. A cloth, too, covered his head, so even peering beyond would reveal only cloth. To an onlooker, it probably seemed as though the elven warrior had removed his helmet and mounted it on his backpack. They rear wyverns here? Annalise questioned. Not here. No, Argrave looked back to Delphasium. The southern tribes that still rear wyverns live further south, where great mountains surround the desert. They're the last bastion against the vessels of Felhorn, persisting off a spring in the mountains. Dangerous place. We'll go near there. But we have no reason to enter the mountains. Ostensibly. Ostensibly, Annalise repeated, as though asking him to explain himself. It would. Be nice to have one, Argrave said musingly. You heard about Maedath, I'm sure. Even Annalise could not hide that the idea intrigued her, but Gilliman put his hand on Argrave's shoulder. Look. He pointed out. Argrave followed his finger. Far away, there was a great black cloud visibly writhing despite the distance. It was no thundercloud, and even Argrave could tell that it was heading towards them, not away from them. Our first sandstorm. At least we didn't leave the low way into this. Well, let's jump into the water, so to speak, to Delphasium, Argrave said positively. He pulled his duster's hood down, shaking some sand out of it, then started walking towards the wall of black clay in the distance. When they neared the wall, a smell that Argrave had been glad to leave behind in the low way entered his nostrils. Death and decay. Fortunately, it was not an all-encompassing smell, but rather one originating from a place in particular. There was a dead body leaning against the walls. The dark-skinned body was male and unhealthily thin, ribs and bones poking out against the flesh as though trying to escape. His was not the only corpse. There were other people taking shelter near the walls. Numbering near fifty, they were unmoving, each and all incredibly skinny. Argrave had thought he looked far too gaunt, but these people's sunken faces and exposed bony frames were uncomfortable merely to look at. Their loose woolen clothing seemed all the looser on their thin bodies. Their dark skin was lined with deformed tattoos, the ink's shapes distorted by their starvation. They huddled underneath cloth canopies held up by wooden stakes. Rats tried to get at the corpses, yet the people would ward them off with weak rebuttals. The rats stayed near, waiting in the shade, waiting for an opportunity. Elsewhere, a group of four at something. As our grave grew nearer, he saw it to be one of the rodents. Nothing was wasted, they drank its blood for moisture, and they ate all of its bits, even gnawing on the bone with their brittle teeth. Most striking was the lack of greed. All of the people divided the rat's parts in equal portions, prioritizing the youngest. These people stayed still, staring from the shade as our grave and his companions passed. None seemed to expect or want something from them, and despite their state, there was a proud warning in their gazes. Their eyes were the color of gold, bright, sharp and brilliant. Though they lacked the strength to bury the dead man, they seemed insistent to defend him from the rats. 
both for sustenance and for the sake of the fallen. Annalise watched them with intense curiosity, and they held her gaze, watching as she passed. Once they were far away, Annalise stepped up beside our grave. Those are the southern tribals, Annalise stated. Our grave interpreted it as a question in part, and so confirmed, yes, the vessels won't kill them outright against their faith, or some such excuse. Instead, they ward them from the town. The guards throw rats over the walls, directly into their camps, enough to sustain them, but not enough for them to really live. They want to break them, have them submit to thraldom, like those within the city. I see. Annalise nodded. Do the Southron elves share their skin tone? Darker. Actually, Argrave answered. We won't see much of them, I suspect. They're all but wiped out. I had wished to speak to my distant kin. Disappointing, she said, sparing one last glance at the people they'd passed. Try not to dwell on those people, Argrave advised. Even if we could help them, they are few. The erectic kit will kill all. Picture that, if it helps. Annalise turned away. She could not meet his eyes, but she nodded. Argrave hoped what he said was enough. His words certainly felt empty, even to him. They followed along the outside of the walls, Argrave leading them towards an entrance to the town that he knew of. Eventually, they saw an established path, though partially buried beneath black sand, the stone road was largely well maintained. Six people stood at the gate, guarding the entrance casually. Doubtless they were more numerous to prevent the southern tribals outside from trying to sneak or force their way in. They wore loose-fitting dark grey clothes with chain mail for armour. They wore traces of purple at points, purely for decoration, sashes, tassels, the like. Their helmets were simple domes with a spike on the centre, yet they wore masks to protect their face from the sand. Argrave saw their weapons, two knives on their belt, plus a spear in hand, and once again lamented that he had not paid off his debtor Earl of Nick. He had completely exhausted his supply of liquid magic from the Amaranthine Heart, yet he suspected there would still be two or three days before he regained his ability to use the blessing. Seeing Argrave and his company approaching, the guards came to attention. Glamon placed himself ahead of Argrave ever the diligent guard. His presence was large enough that the guards looked visibly nervous. Doubtless Annalise and Argrave's tall stature amplified that effect. They gathered in front of the gate, and seeing their movement, Argrave stopped Gilliman. Hold, one stepped forward, using the spear as a walking stick. State your business. Just traveling, looking to stay within the town. I was told there was plenty of inns here at Delphasium. Argrave stepped up beside Gilliman. The guard stared up at Argrave, expression mostly indiscernible behind his white mask. His eyes were suspicious, though and he asked, traveling where? Deep south, Argent, visiting an old friend, Argrave supplied, some friendship, to travel so far over the burnt desert, the guard noted, his suspicions somewhat abated by Argrave's knowledge of a city deep within the desert, you come from the north, not Vasca, if that's what you're asking, Argrave shook his head, knowing well the hostility between those in the burnt desert and Vasca, we came from further north, where the land is frozen most of the year, it's why we're so pale, also why we came during the winter, suspect we'd melt in the hottest time of the year. The guard let out a wheezing laugh at that. All right. He nodded. You can enter. No tolls here, not for travelers. You know our laws. Pay the taxes. No violence, no theft, and no using magic within the city. Unless you're associated with the vessels of Felhorn. And lastly, don't give water to outsiders. The guard nodded. Merchants will check for this mark on the back of your hand. He raised his hand up revealing a blue cross with four X's on the tips. There was something mystical about the tattoo, it shimmered like sapphire lake water on the man's backhand. Since you don't have them, you'll have to pay the taxes. Got it, Argrave nodded. The tattoo marked a person as a citizen sworn to a vessel. They doubled as constant monitors, ensuring those that broke the laws could not do so secretly. The man lowered his hand, gaze moving from between Gilliman and Annalise. Northern elves, <laughs> rumor has it they sacked a city in Vasca. I've heard the same, Argrave nodded. Didn't confirm it though. The guard's gaze lingered on them. Make sure they cause no trouble, he finally warned, stepping aside. They passed by the guards, Argrave leading them ahead. Most of their attention stayed on Gilliman. Argrave felt a little nervous, wondering if any would be able to see Garm, but he didn't dare let that show in his actions or expression. They passed beneath the black clay walls of Delphasium, entering into the town beyond. No comment was made about the helmet hiding a severed head on Gilliman's back, and so they entered into the oasis town without issue. The change in scenery was dramatic. The outside had been a desolate wasteland of blackness, utterly devoid of flora, yet within the walls was a drastic change. The buildings and streets were all made of a clean white rock reminiscent of marble. Black plants lined the walkways, reminiscent of agave or aloe vera, while palm trees with black leaves bearing bright purple fruits filled vast orchards. Though plants black in color were most abundant, extremely bright crops persisted everywhere. Reds, purples, yellows, and blues. There were peppers, olives, wildflowers and other such hardy desert plants. Though the streets were not exceptionally busy, they were still somewhat crowded. The people wore multicolored loose-fitting robes and were adorned with plentiful jewelry. The denizens of the burnt desert were disparate from the pale people of Vasca, 
skin tone ranging from a light down color to a dark brown. Their hair was dark, and much of it was bound with golden ornaments bearing bright jewelry or silken cloth with bright dye. Argrave, Annalise, and Gilliman could not stick out more if they tried. They were ridiculously tall, pale, and majority elven. Argrave had grown used to being watched, lumbering stick that he was. But it redoubled in this place. People openly spoke of them, pointing as they passed. It was a wonder they were not stopped by random people on the street. Perhaps only Gilliman's intimidating presence spared them that. Yet Argrave walked by, trying his best to ignore things. Eventually, they came to the central square. There, a great marble sculpture stood tall, depicting a naked woman holding a horn overflowing with fruit. Two spouts of water rose beside her. It was a depiction of Fellhorn, not the god itself, but of its harvest. Argrave paused at the fountain, watching the water spray the central square wantonly. His mind involuntarily conjured images of the southern tribals outside the walls. He had known what to expect coming here but seeing it in person was a different experience entirely. He bit his lip, mindful not to express his disapproval visually lest he gain the ire of the watching crowd. He turned to Gilliman. The place, it's this way. It'll be a bit more expensive because we're using Vasca coins, but I think we should be able to pass by the night. He pointed to both of them. Now, something to note, don't let people touch your skin easily. If a vessel of Felhorn has skin contact, they can do a hell of a lot of damage. In seconds, shake hands, your hand will shrivel in seconds. Both nodded seriously. That sandstorm, think it's going to occupy the south, Gleman commented, staring beyond the walls. I'm told they can last days. Argrave followed his gaze. If he had been playing Heroes of Berinder, a sandstorm simply meant that his vision would be obscured. In reality, though, traveling during a sandstorm was all but a death sentence. We worry about that tomorrow. I need to wash the taste of that Cyrilo out of my mouth, said Argrave, stepping away from the water fountain. You can try spicy food, Annalise. This will be entertaining he said with a smile. Annalise raised a curious brow. You must tell me of the food of the place you come from, she began, following him. The three ventured deeper into the oasis town. Near the fountain, a well-dressed man watched them leave. His gaze lingered for a long while, and then he turned, heading for a palatial estate in the distance. Chapter 108 The Unexpected Elias opened a set of thick stone doors, stepping into a cold hall. His father sat there at his desk. At Elias' entry, he set down a dagger. Father, Elias greeted a bit stiffly. Margrave Reinhardt stared at his son. He said nothing for an uncomfortably long period, and Elias felt the need to squirm. He managed to stay still, though only with his best effort. Where is your fiancé? The Margrave asked. I introduced her to Rose. Elias stepped forward. I figured she should know my sister if she is to be a part of the family. They seem to be getting along when you called me, he said optimistically. Both enjoy books. The two are similar. I think. Rydia is near as sweet as Rose. The Margrave nodded. I'm glad there is some affection forming between the two of you. Elias hung his head. Dot I'm sorry. I know I should have. Don't apologize. You did well. Reinhardt interrupted. Elias raised his head back up, red eyes wide. You made a decisive choice as a leader to earn a benefit, and to protect your people. This is something that I wanted you to learn, and you learned it. Reinhardt spread his arms out. The fact that you ignored my authority doesn't matter, because you considered the people first. Well, I, Argrave is the one who made this happen, Elias deflected, his promise of not mentioning Argrave vanishing when blame turned into praise. He was the smart one. He saw what would happen and made it a reality. I just was led round. That one seems to be the sole force for change in this family. Reinhardt looked away. It doesn't matter. Reinhardt grabbed the dagger on his desk, tossing it aside. He retrieved a paper, handing it to Elias. This came not hours ago. Elias took two steps forward, retrieving the paper. He oriented it to read it properly then furrowed his brows. After a time, he rose his head. Elbrail declared its support of our cause. Margrave Reinhardt nodded. Elias smiled. That's... that's great. That boy you brought, Stain. Reinhardt continued, not sharing his son's jubilation. He tells me of some things. He's been... he said he was keeping his ears on the beating heart of the underworld. I didn't know what he meant, but he elaborated that he was keeping track of rumors. Reinhardt sighed and shook his head. I don't know what he's saying half the time. He's a good one at heart, even if he does like to do some less than reputable things. He didn't have a good Kai, let me finish. Reinhardt held out his big hand. Despite this letter, Stain says a lot of people are talking about unrest in Elbril. He says people claim someone is stirring the people against the Lord, bringing to light certain injustices, unjust taxes, corrupt guards, malfeasance by those near the Duke. That's... is that true? These incidents, that is... Elias questioned. I'm not saying Duke Mirage is a saint, far from it, but we need his support in the war, and someone is moving against him, trying to oust him from power. Elias stepped away, thinking, then turned back and nodded seriously. What do we do about it? Reinhardt leaned back in the chair, his brawny frame completely hiding the backrest. He sighed for a long, long while. I don't know. Elias was taken aback, as though he'd never heard his father say that. But we need to figure it out, 
the margrave said. Tomorrow, I'll call together some advisors I trust. We'll discuss this, decide how to act. Personally, I think that you and Stain should go there and maintain order. Doubtless the Duke will welcome it. If someone is trying to undermine the Duke, it's definitely going to be a supporter of Vesca, Elias said. It would be dangerous to go there. I will keep that in mind, should this come to pass, the Margrave shook his head. But this person, or group of persons, evidently lacks the strength for an outright coup. I see, Elias nodded. Reinhardt pointed at Elias. Tomorrow, I want you up early. Come to me, here. We'll talk more then. For now. Ensure your fiancé is comfortable here. Reinhardt leaned forward once more, picking up the dagger he'd set aside and examining it. Thank you, father, Elias said, lowering his head slightly. He turned and opened the stone door, stepping out. As he made to leave, he stopped. Elias turned, grabbing the stone door. Argrave told me something at the Tower of the Grey Owl. Reinhardt kept the dagger in hand, looking up coldly towards his son. And, he said there was a salamander. On the hills of Visn, Elias proceeded carefully. Is this pertinent? The Margrave questioned. Argrave seemed to be under the impression this salamander might hold some secret in healing Rose. Elias took his hand off the stone door and stepped back into the room. I looked into this. And, well, some of it holds true. There are barbarians in Visn, known for their regenerative abilities. These salamanders, too. The Margrave turned his ruby eyes away from his son. If you think it has merit, look into it further. Thank you, father, Elias said once more, a little more excitement on his tone. He left and shut the door quickly. The Margrave dropped the dagger and it clattered against the desk. This boy. Maybe I need to meet him once more. Reinhardt rubbed his forehead, clearly torn. Hash. Argrave sat on a table outside in the chilly air of the dawn, warming himself up beneath the sun's beams. Annalise sat adjacent to him. The and they'd stayed at had goat for breakfast, the cost had been exorbitant, but Argrave did not lack money even still. Though Argrave might have found the prospect of a new type of meat unappealing, for the first time in a long while. The meat was seasoned, rock salt, peppers, and other such things to give it flavor. Those people outside. Annalise spoke, gazed distant. Still thinking about that? Argrave questioned. I told you, it does nothing for us to get involved. Even if we could change things, something that'd take years, it does nothing for the bigger picture. We, alone, should fight an entire region's religion, fix an entire region's problems. I feel guilty too, but I'd feel guiltier if I had to watch Gerexik Kiakilich and every living thing alive because we spent our time tackling something beyond our capability. She nodded, refocusing her gaze on our grave. Why do they refuse to submit to the vessel's revoked liberties, delegated tasks, forced non-violence, forced worship of Felhorn? and long-standing hatred, our grave sunrise quickly. They refuse to surrender their cultural traditions. Yet life here does not seem so bad, Annalise looked around. If they would simply submit, then, because this is a trading town, sustained largely by farming, our grave summarized. Beyond forced labor in the fields, we can't see much injustice elsewhere. Mining settlements, plantations. We'll see the worst of the place soon enough. Our grave tapped his finger on the table. Unless you can think of an alternative I'm missing, feeling guilty will just distract us. Okay she said with a resigned sigh. It is difficult to suppress guilt when people starve outside the walls. And you would eat things like this constantly? Annalise spoke, leaning in close to Argrave. Well, yeah, but come on, Argrave pointed to her. You had salted meat in Veiden. It was sea salt, granted, but it's not much different. We salt our food for preservation, not for taste, she countered. Yet hearing you describe your home, I suppose I can understand why you detest being dirty so much. Argrave tapped his fingers on the table. It still felt a bit awkward to speak of his home so openly, and he somewhat loathed the feelings of homesickness that would swell whenever he confronted it. I was an outlier, even there. Argrave shook his head. What do you miss most? She asked, placing her arms on the table. Music. Argrave answered without missing a beat. I. There were so many instruments, it's difficult to even begin to list them all. Millennia of cultural traditions and developments were distilled into countless types of music, each and all wonderful and unique. And above all, music wasn't something reserved for special occasions, parties, festivals, what have you. Anyone could listen to music, anywhere. We have electricity to thank for that. Annalise stared up at his face, bright-eyed. She opened her mouth to speak but Gilliman stepped up to them, still wearing his backpack with garm on it. The elven vampire removed the pack, setting it beside the table and then sat down. Gilliman, you're back, Argrave greeted. Sandstorms still raging, and it shows no signs of subsiding, Gilliman reported as he settled himself. Roads are blocked, no travel to or from the town. Even the merchants refuse to go. Argrave sighed. Damn it all. He looked at Garm, encased in Gilliman's helmet. How are you, Garm? Fine, I suppose. This one has the steadiest step, the least shaking. And he's the tallest, so I can see more came his muffled voice. I'm satisfied with this arrangement. You tell me if you think of anything long term for disguises. 
Argrave tapped his chest. Or whoever. I suppose they can transmit it to me. I like the helmet, Garm said. Feels safe, I suppose. Craft something around the stake, turn it into a walking stick, encase me in a decorative helmet. That might work. Something to consider, Argrave nodded. Just difficult finding a craftsman that's trustworthy, Argrave scratched his lip, trying to conjure names. As I said, this seems to suffice for now, Garm concluded. Argrave nodded, letting the silence stretch out. Guess we have more time to do nothing. It's more than a little welcome, after what happened in the low way, but I feel like I'm wasting time. Argrave leaned back in his chair and crossed one leg over the other. What should we do? Beyond waiting out the storm, of course, ideally. Glamon looked around, eyeing the passers-by. We should secure a place with a caravan. It'll be slower moving, but should a sandstorm hit in the middle of the road, we'll have plenty of supply and a good navigator. We'll also have a safer place to take shelter without draining your magic. Sounds reasonable, Argrave agreed. But it'll be difficult to get anyone to agree to that. People around here. They don't seem especially trusting, Argrave waved his hands about. Even sitting, they were still watched. People didn't bother them overtly, necessarily but there was an inherent caution of them that marked them as outsiders. Glamon leaned back in the chair, and it creaked against his weight. True, he conceded. You don't have any ideas on that front? Something sweet to worm your way onto the back of a luxury carriage? Decided to ease on the genius plans, at least until they're needed. Argrave tapped his temple. Let the juices ferment in my head. When they're needed. Boom. He emulated his head exploding. It'll go as perfectly as just. Trust me on this one. Annalise laughed and lowered her head into her arms slouching. Her hair fell over her face, and she moved it aside to stare at Argrave with one ambry. I am glad to see you regained some confidence lost in the low way, she said. Argrave raised a brow, only realizing that fact when she mentioned it. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Gilliman straighten, turning on his chair. Argrave followed his gaze, and then caught sight of four white-robed guardsmen approaching them. Their leader held a piece of paper, while the other four bore only knives. Gilliman stood, turning while Argrave remained sitting casually. The guards came up to Argrave's party. The one bearing paper stepped forth, bowing slightly. Gentlemen. Madame, he bowed to each in turn. We come on behalf of Mistress Tasha of Delphasium. He held out the piece of paper, holding it above his head as he bowed. It was a small roll, bound by a purple sash. Argrave gestured towards Gilliman to take the paper. The elven vampire took it gingerly, being sure not to crush it. Why? asked Targrave. The man's back straightened. Mistress Tasha is curious about your party of three and wishes for you to join her for a feast tonight in her palace, in hopes you might share stories of the northern lands. Little news passes beyond the Lion's and Castle. Argrave bit his lip, thinking his response carefully. Say, purely hypothetical, we can't make it. What happens? The mistress would be quite sad, but I am sure she would understand, the man said, expression indiscernible beneath his cloth mask. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. Madame. He bowed once more and then stepped away. Argrave raised a brow, turning to look at Annalise as the guards walked away. Chapter 109, Lure of the Fellhorn. Argrave shut the door to the room, taking a breath before turning around. The rolled up piece of paper that had been delivered to them sat in the center of a table, each of them hovering about it as though it was something dangerous that needed to be watched. After glancing between his two companions, who remained silent, he stepped up to the paper. He removed the purple sash, unrolling the paper gingerly with his gloves. He read through it. Huh. He lowered it. It really is just an invitation, thought that be more, maybe. Secret message, a death threat, something. Do you know the sender? Annalise asked. Sure, Argrave nodded. He placed one hand to his chin as he recounted, this mistress Tasha is a mage, relatively stable and pacific, yet quiet. Detached and inhuman. Argrave looked up and added, just like most of the vessels, come to think of it. And the rank? Annalise pressed further. Not applicable. Argrave shook his head. Their source of power isn't magic. They're associated with Felhorn. Vessel isn't a metaphor. They're conduits for Felhorn's aspects. They're capable of taking and expunging waters in oceanic proportions, and with far more freedom than most magic offers. Each vessel is an oasis in and of themselves, each with variable capacities. Then perhaps mage is not the best term, Annalise posited. Glamon held out a hand. All that matters, we can refuse this without consequence. I mean, reasonably, yes, Argrave said, holding his hands out but we wouldn't earn any friends. If I learned anything from Jast, having Elaine as an ally was helpful in ways I hadn't even predicted. And with a sandstorm, traveling is impossible anyway. Glamon crossed his arms, looking completely neutral at the prospect. Annalise, though, shook her head, provided there are no ulterior motives, no other forces at work. Annalise looked to Argrave, who confirmed this with a relatively confident nod. If there are no others involved, we were clearly invited as a spectacle, a passing amusement, just as we were for most of the people in this. Delphasium. Is that really problematic? Argrave questioned. I can trust that they won't force us to do anything. Mistress Tasha won't do anything to threaten her peace. A few laughs, a few jeers. 
and it isn't as though we can't embarrass them in turn. Annalise crossed her arms. I know what I saw, and those that this Mistress Tasha thinks less of are sitting outside the walls, no food or drink. Argrave nodded. I see your point. But, harsh as it is to say, those people refuse to bend. And so they break. Argrave held his hands out as though it were a pity and shook his head. I'm willing to be flexible to get what I need. I'll work in the system instead of struggling to exist without it. So, unless either of you two disagree, I think we have no reason to refuse. Both stood around, considering his words without making any final decisions. Come now, Argrave encouraged. We have little else to do besides wait at the storm, reading books. We'll have plenty of that to do in the times leading up to the feast, and plenty more to do after. Okay, Annalise nodded and Gilliman soon joined her in the gesture. Then it's settled, let's. And what of me? Garm asked. You don't intend to bring me with, I hope. Argrave looked down at him. That's a good point. You'd forgotten about me, Garm accused. No, Argrave insisted, lying. I just think that you would be best suited to staying here, watching over our things. Garm closed his eyes. I. Could you make it so I can see outside, at least? He looked up at Argrave. I do not wish to endure monotony of staring at a wall, or a cloth blanket for hours unending. Let me see people. He seemed pitiable in that moment, and so Argrave nodded. Hash. Argrave had cleaned up his black leather gear as best he could, and the three of them walked to the palatial estate of Mistress Tasha. The rest of the city was quite decadent and grand, like a pearl amidst the desert, yet her estate was doubly so, giant, made of marble, and with a grand tower looming behind it, standing as a beacon for travelers. Its fence and gate were made of gold it seemed, though perhaps it was a cheap metal made in imitation. Argrave was no expert. The city of Delphasium looked especially beautiful in the night. The moonlight reflected off the marble walkways, giving one the impression they were walking on resplendent pearls. It was a little chilly, but Argrave's leather more than sufficed for heat. Where do they get all of this rock? Annalise questioned. The question caught Argrave off guard. I don't. It's imported, if I remember right, from quarries further south. More tributaries to the vessels, I suppose. Quite an ordeal, to haul rocks across the desert. She noted. Anything for a drink, I guess. Argrave looked around. Annalise crossed her arms. I worry for Garm, sometimes. What? Argrave said at once, incredulously. Why? Worried someone will break in? That could be a problem, certainly. No, not in that way. She waved her hand at him. He acts like he has come to terms with what has happened to him, but I do not believe he has, she mused, walking towards the gates. He hides it pretty well. Then, Argrave commented cynically. He was crying. Glimmon cut in. Argrave turned to look at him. When? Glimmon did not look from the gate ahead as he said, when you two were enjoying the food this morning. Goat meat. I think it was. Argrave could not help but widen his eyes in surprise, while Annalise nodded. Her point affirmed. Good lord. That is pretty depressing, Argrave admitted. You wish to speak of winning allies. Annalise looked at Argrave, shrugging. Garm would be a good place to start. Argrave pointed a finger at her. He refused, even after we were amply honest with him. He's made his position on this matter very clear. If he's going to do anything to help us, he has to receive something in return. I do not know you to take things personally like that, Annalise refuted. And I cannot think that, alone, is why you dislike him. It takes much for you to dislike someone. The Sentinels are the only I can think of. Dislike him? Argrave repeated. Why would you? He trailed off, unable to finish the sentence. Well, fine, sure. I don't exactly trust that he has my back. You both can't deny he doesn't exude trustworthiness. If he had legs. I'm sure he'd already have scurried off elsewhere. Neither responded to that, and they came ever closer to the gate of Mistress Tasha's estate. Argrave stepped ahead, stopping them both. Why do you think I dislike him, then? He asked Annalise. She seemed hesitant to answer. After Argrave's unflinching gaze, she eventually relented, saying, two reasons. One, you have told us you know absolutely nothing about him, and that disquiets you. Two, you see yourself reflected in him. Argrave's mouth fell open for a moment, then he laughed. What, we've got along? thin stick where there should be a body. Argrave questioned. What do you mean by that, exactly? What do the two of us have in common? He and Gilliman have more in common. They both watch other people eat, unable to do so themselves, as for the crying. Argrave trailed off, catching a fierce glare from Gilliman. Annalise continued, saying, just as you, he awoke in a world familiar to him, yet entirely unfamiliar to him, with limited capabilities coupled with an array of useful, even unique knowledge. The situations are different, yet similar, certainly enough to draw comparison. She gestured towards Argrave, imploring him to consider what she said. Argrave bit his lips, trying to think of something to say in retaliation. He paused, brows furrowing. Huh, I'm not trying to consider her point, just trying to think of something to retaliate with. That alone was evidence enough that she might have a point, and so Argrave lowered his head, rubbing his forehead bitterly. Hell of a bomb to drop on me just before we enter a place where I have to use my head. She laughed lightly. That is a good point. I apologize. I simply felt it needed to be said. 
She lowered her head to lock eyes with him and then continued mischievously. Besides, I have found that you work well in stressful situations. That right? Argrave lifted his head back up and smiled. Well, I'm also good at refusing to think about things. I'll just hide away this uncomfortable realization for now. He turned on his heel, walking towards Mistress Tasha's palace. Annalise smiled and followed behind. Glamon paused for a moment, watching the two of them. He shook his head and moved to catch up. They came to the presently open golden gates, where two guardsmen waited. Argrave had expected to be stopped, but the people standing there gave them nods. The mistress told us to expect you. Please, enter. You are expected. The guard gestured politely. Should I hold on to this? Argrave held out the paper he'd been given. Ah, yes, I had forgotten. The guard took it from his hands. Enjoy. Argrave nodded and stepped into the mistress's estate. Though the entire city of Delphasium was not lacking for decadence, this place seemed to be a state beyond. The lit lamps were made of gold, and the walkways were all adorned with vivacious and green life, thriving and beautiful. Purple cloth hung from windows and pillars, though they bore no banner. Their party continued on slowly. Argrave found it a little difficult to appreciate the scenery, considering what he had seen outside the walls of Delphasium. He saw a few white-robed people walking about. Though there was something off about their skin, Argrave recognized them as vessels, though he could not get a sufficient glimpse to judge their appearance fully. Evidently Gilliman had, for his eyes followed them as they passed. They smell of nothing, he said in concern. They probably smell like water, Argrave commentated quietly. These people wouldn't have any of the functions to generate the smells, no oils, no sweats, no tears. They've transcended a physical form. Gilliman looked back, gesturing for Argrave to continue. They carried on, heading towards an open entryway where purple cloth fell down. People pushed it aside and moved to and from, as they neared. The sounds of reverie started to become apparent. About 30 or so, Glamon spoke to Argrave. Chapter 110, Empty Vessels. The first thing that Argrave noticed when entering the palatial estate of Mistress Tasha was neither a sound, nor a sight, nor a smell. Instead, it was a sensation. The air around them felt incredibly dry. It was strange, then, that the second thing he processed was the presence of rushing water. Argrave stepped past the purple cloth blocking the entrance, staring into the room. Arrayed before him was a decadent marble table inlaid with gold at the corners. It was low set, falling just short of Argrave's knees. The top of it had been covered with purple felt. In each corner of the room, there were small waterfalls pouring from golden horns into small pools. People sat around the table, though instead of in chairs, they sat atop mounds of pillows in very casual positions. As Argrave entered, most of them came to attention sitting straighter and casting curious glances at the newly arrived three. They all wore very bright and catching colors. Argrave recognized them to be vessels. Each and every vessel had a strange, almost aquatic quality to their dark skin. It glistened as though fresh out of a pool, yet not a drop of liquid could be seen anywhere on them. Their hair had a silken quality to it, almost oily, and it seemed to move about, spurred by an unfelt wind. Argrave recognized some. Most prominently, he recognized the woman at the head of the table, Mistress Tasha. She rested amidst a pile of red and gold pillows wearing a purple dress studded with gemstones. The dress was loose and exposed much of her dark olive skin. She was a robust woman, not fat, exactly, but certainly fleshy. Argrave locked eyes with her, and she sat up amidst her pillows. She raised both hands in the air. Her actions had a sort of flowing grace to them, each moving to the next without ceasing. Greetings, wanderers from the distant north. She greeted, her voice smooth and pleasant. My invitation, it seems, was well received. I am pleased to see you elected to dine with us. Argrave stepped forward allowing room for Annalise and Gilliman to follow him in. Their eyes wandered around the room while the vessels sitting watched them. Placing a hand to his chest, Argrave lowered his head a little. Thank you for welcoming us into your home, Mistress Tasha. Argrave returned her greeting. She beamed, showing perfect white teeth. She gestured towards an empty mound of pillows beside her. Please, come and sit. You and your companions have been arranged a place at the seat of honor. What may we call you? I am Argrave, and these two are Gilliman and Annalise, he introduced as he took slow, steady steps into the room. Somewhat overwhelmed by the sense of hospitality all were projecting, the sense of consideration and kindness was intense enough to feel feigned. Argrave possessed knowledge enough of these people's characters to believe he was safe, but recent events had proven he was not all-knowing. Most suspected our invitation would be rebuffed, a vessel spoke, a man with a clean-shaven face. It is not often that northerners pass through here. The people of the north fear this place, a land of barbarians and heat, nothing more. Or so the people of Vasca think. But we have quelled things, don't you agree? I made it here without issue, Argrave replied, finally making it to the end of the table. Mistress Tasha fluidly gestured for them to sit, and Argrave lowered himself into the pillows. He found that the closer he grew to the vessels, the moister the air became, as through they were isolated in a bubble of wetness. My chefs are still preparing our meal, Tasha explained as Argrave looked about. And tell me, gentleman Argrave, how does this town of mine treat you? Argrave shrugged while nodding, 
Having marble beneath my feet is like walking on clouds compared to that heavy black sand outside the walls. And the food's been nice, part of the reason I was swayed to come, in fact. And the two northern elves? Tasha smiled, turning to Gilliman and Annalise as if prompting them for their answer. Gilliman crossed his arms and nodded, while Annalise added, This place cannot have been easy to build, isolated as it is. Mistress Tasha sunk back into her pillows and placed her hand on the top of her chest. Indeed, my predecessor spent his life completing this place, passing away at 212. She nodded as if in peace. It is a shame you had to see it sullied by the presence of the tribals. My guards told me you passed by them, she gestured. We did, said Argrave quickly, hoping to move on. There is something I was curious about. Regarding the tribals, Annalise questioned, leaning forth and moving some pillows aside. Argrave looked to her, hoping to warn her away from asking an offensive question, but she stared at Mistress Tatian undaunted. Please, I'd be happy to answer your questions, Mistress Tasha beckoned with a smile. Why starve and deprive the southern tribals instead of killing them outright? She tilted her head. Argrave straightened his back and scratched the top of his lip, casting a miffed glance at Annalise. She did not seem to lack confidence in her question, though. Ah. I suspect it may be difficult for a foreigner to understand, Mistress Tasha nodded. The eternal downpour of Felhorn rains only water, never blood, a vessel spoke zealously. If they are to die, let them die in the cool embrace of Felhorn or at their own hand, in a pool of misery. Either way, his eternal reign will someday welcome them into his vessels. Indeed, Mistress Tasha pointed to the one who'd spoken. Though the southern tribals waged war unending, we vessels are but humble servants of Felhorn. He is the unceasing rain and the constant flood. His will is our will. Ours is a different conquest, a conquest of the mind and of faith. Mistress Tasha held out her hand, and the skin on her palm seemed to liquefy before bursting up into the air in a steady spout. It was but a small show of the power of a vessel, no more than a party trick but it served to illustrate their power. They embodied the water, taking it in and expelling it at will. Though, perhaps at will was incorrect, it was at the will of their god, Felhorn. Their power was, in many ways, similar to Argrave's blessing of supersession vested in him by Erlebn. Each and every living person can be made a follower. Some of these followers will eventually give birth to vessels. Like this, we bring a peace to this land, that is but one aspect of the great eternal reign of Felhorn we hope to bring to this desolate land. The water spout coming from her hand rose, and then she closed her hand and it dissipated. Argrave digested those words in silence. They were convincing, almost noble. Had Argrave only seen Delphasium, he might have even agreed with them entirely. But the rest of the burnt desert was not the same as this place. Argrave looked at Annalise, grateful at least that she did not seem especially moved. Well, Argrave said, settling back into the pillows now that things had resolved themselves without aggravating their hosts. I am thankful for both your generous invitation and the beautiful sights within Delphasium. The pleasure is ours, Mistress Stacia returned. If you worry for your safety, Fear not the tribals, one man spoke from the corner of the table. Their numbers dwindle by the day. Rats feast upon their corpses, and they feast upon the rats, growing diseased from it. They drink blood for sustenance. All of this hardship merely because they refuse to recognize him, submit to him. Indeed, a woman agreed. Felhorn renders all equal beneath him. The hardships of an uncivilized life, theft, violence, blasphemy. All transgressors are drained, and society is at peace. Drained? repeated Gilliman. It is Felhorn's gift, a man explained. The transgressor has violated Felhorn's laws, and in doing so, they must surrender all within themselves to a vessel. We vessels absorb their souls, offering them to our lord Felhorn. In return, he vests more of his power upon us. Like this, Felhorn's eternal reign spreads, and we vessels grow to accommodate more of his blessing. Argrave scratched the back of his neck to hide his expression while Mistress Tasha hurriedly added, Let us not speak of grim things just before a meal. As if summoned by her words, people walked through the purple cloth marking the doorway to the room. They held silver trays of food, and the vessels clamored happily when the servants came into view. As the servants continued to lay decadent meals before each and every person present at the table, Mistress Tasha spoke to Argrave. Argrave, was it? Tasha asked, and when Argrave nodded, she continued, Now that we have told you of our home, I wish to hear of yours, if it pleases you. Argrave rubbed his gloved hands together. Do you want to hear of Aiden, land of the snow elves? or the lands north of Vasca, Mistress Tasha mused, leaning forth as food was placed before her. You passed through Vasca? Did you not? She questioned, because, truly, what is occurring there at present intrigues me the most. Tumult can spread beyond borders. There's a civil war, Argrave stated plainly. House Parban intends to combat the royal house Vasca. Their spheres of influence largely constitute the south and the north, respectively. Tell me more, Mistress Tasha urged. Hash. This was an enlightening conversation, Mistress Tasha said placing her fork down on the table. Glad I could help, Argrave returned, having left much of his grand steak unfinished. It had tasted delicious, but it was far too large for someone like him. 
Perhaps this is the time to forge a relationship with House Parban. Doubtless they will be amenable to the people that have quelled the southern barbarian menace that has plagued their Margravate for centuries. I cannot be the judge of that, Argrave shook his head. Well, I am pleased that you came to my palace, Mistress Tasha smiled. I am told you had intended to go to Argent. Yes, but at present, a sandstorm blocks the road south, Argrave clicked his tongue. Unfortunate thing, that. Indeed it is, Mistress Tasha sympathized. There seem to be many more of those, lately, for reasons I cannot begin to surmise. Perhaps it's because things have dried up to a ridiculous point, Argrave wished to say, but wisely refrained. Argrave paused for a bit, and then discreetly added, We had intended to travel with a merchant caravan, but many proved unreceptive to outsiders. Mr. Stacia raised a brow. Truly? Now that is a sad thing, indeed. Perhaps I can help out some on that front, she suggested. Argrave smiled. Now, those words taste much better than the meal I just ate. Hash. That was a little too tense for my tastes, Argrave mused stretching as they walked down the path. Those people. Annalise looked back at the Golden Gate. Not exactly paragons, I know, Argrave finished, stopping to speak to her. Annalise turned her head back to Argrave. What you say is true, but I refer to their deadened emotions. They experience less of everything, joy, happiness, rage, sorrow. It is all muted, drowned out, Argrave posited. It's why I called them inhuman. They aren't called vessels because they're full. They're called so because they're empty. Are they powerful? Glamon questioned. Yeah. Argrave said, hard to quantify or qualify as it is standard magic. That little trick she demonstrated, spouting water, it can propel fast enough to tear off limbs, and travel for miles. The stronger ones can, anyway. And every moment they touch you, they can drain you. Steal every bit of liquid inside you. It's so painful that it's difficult to stop once it's started. Or so went the law. Never experienced it. Argrave shook his head. Never hoped to. Is it prudent to accept a favor from that woman? Annalise questioned. Being friendly with these people is for the best. Argrave nodded, resuming their walk back to the inn. We have to use whatever we can against Gerectic Kiet. Don't forget this. If you like this audiobook, subscribe the channel for more videos like this. And join my Patreon if you want to support me, where you can find the complete collection. Jekyll Among Snakes audiobooks. Hurry up. What are you waiting for? Leave some comment and let me know if you guys like this story, or you have a web novel you like and want to hear its audiobook. I will be happy to create them for you. Please like, share, and leave a comment on the video.